everyone and welcome to the High Runa Film Festival. My name is Kava Bakas. I'm the Festival Director of Green Screen, the Environmental Film Festival. Um, and I'm very happy to be here hosting a QA um, after a series of environmental films at High Runa. Um, and I'm really happy that uh, the festival is paying attention to environmental issues and giving it a platform of its own um, inside of the festival with all the other great films and, and content and activities taking place. Um, I think it, it, it's really important um, and certainly a, a, a good nod from the festival organizers to ensure that the environmental films in the program. So um, hats off to Haruna Film Festival for that and, and thanks from Green Screen. Um, and also congratulations uh, to the festival for actually, um, you know, making it this far, you know, in terms of actually having a festival this year. It's been a tough year, um, in particular for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, of course, as we all know, with the, the volcano eruption and the pandemic and all the craziness that's been happening. Um, so for you guys to, for the festival to actually come off um, in, in such a, a grand style, um, it really speaks to the dedication of the team of Ico and Shane and, and all the others um, over in St. Vincent doing the work and, and other places in the world, of course. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, 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 to congratulate you guys. It's, it's really good to see. Um, and so now I, I wanna um, you know, turn my attention now to our panelists tonight, um, who include uh, Kemba Jaramogi of the Fonz Amunds uh, community Reforestation Project uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, St. Anne's Trinidad and Tobago, and John Stolmeyer, who's a permaculture expert, artist, practitioner, um, uh, and, and many other things. Um, but I'd like both John and Camber uh, just to take a, a quick moment and introduce yourselves, and then we can jump right into the discussion about the films tonight. Welcome, John and Camber. Kemba, if you want to go first, ladies first. Hi, everyone. So I just have the dog in the background that is making quite a lot of noise. But um, welcome and good evening to everyone. So I'm Kemba Jaramogi, and I'm the technical director here. And I focus quite a lot on education and awareness programs and really trying to break up the anatomy when it comes to, you know, how we look at the forest, how we look at the resources. And as one of my board members so rightfully coined, you know, working towards demystifying the bush, you know, and getting that connection to nature going. So, you know, that is one of the things that I'm quite passionate about in the work that I do here at Fonsumon. John? Yeah, I'm John Stolmeyer, and um, I was born in St. Anne's watershed and grew up here. And um, while I was in Canada, I came across a movement of um, people coming out of the back to the land, hippie commune, self, you know, um, intentional community, um, you know, lives. Um, and we call ourselves bioregionalists. So I came in contact with bioregionalism and it inspired me to come back home and start sharing that vision of, of being, you know, connected to an ecosystem, a watershed a bioregion, that our reality as human beings is that we are biological creatures and that we are, you know, embedded in a living community of other organisms, of um, breezes and, and winds and, and rains and, you know, different environmental conditions. And that becoming um, family with, with those elements and you know, learning to love as, as a family, your watershed and all these species that you share it with. So that is what um, brings me as an artist um, to, yes, what um, directs my, my attention as an artist is to um, promote this vision of our complete loving connection to all life on earth and an intelligent cosmos. All our relations. That's All good. our relations. Thanks, Kava. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Um, yeah, full disclosure to everybody viewing. Uh, you know, I, I've known John quite a while, and he was a, a, a early supporter of um, the work that I do um, through uh, Green Screen and Sustain TNT and Kemba as well. Um, 
same really an uh, early supporter early collaborator um uh, we've been I've, I've been doing it over 10 years now going on 11 or 12 years now um so i know both john and kemba rather well and we all live in the same time's watershed <laughs> so um i think that might be a good place for us to, to to jump off the discussion in terms of the films um one of the films that we saw um my watershed my home directed by ronda chansu um basically explored um the fundamental forestation project um what is all about um and you know it's in the title my watershed right um so let's start there you know um john i'll ask you you know you know just tell us what a watershed is and how humans impact their watershed just by them sort of being there just by their presence yes so everybody lives in a watershed um everybody who lives on land um and the watershed, you know, if you're living in a mountainous area, if you look up to the mountain, the ridge line that you can see, it will have a particular shape depending where you're standing. That, that ridge line represents the boundary between when the rain falls, the water that will flow towards you and the water that will flow away from you into the neighboring watershed. So everybody lives in a watershed that, um, is represented by a catchment area when the rain falls it comes down from the um, peaks of the mountains and the hills and through tributaries flows into a main river and then out to the sea so everybody does live in a watershed and watersheds are made up of ecosystems so you have ecosystems that are unique to the source of the watershed up high in the mountains you have in the medium range foothills and then you have out on the floodplain and then out in the mangrove swamps you have different ecosystems that all together work to, for the functioning of the watershed and for most of humans evolution we all lived in watersheds in ways that actually often enhanced the biodiversity of that watershed you know all life on earth is food, you know, everything eats everything else. So if you are doing anything to disturb the balance in your watershed, you get feedback very quickly and you learn how to eventually come into balance. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that, that is how most of our human experience with our bioregions have been in the past. But yeah. with civilization urbanization and um where we've got to now with industrial civilization people are cut off from nature they don't experience nature directly on a day-to-day -day basis they live in boxes you know they move around in um internal combustion engines and then they, they spend a lot of their working time in boxes as well and mm -hmm. so or the maintenance, the construction and, and maintenance of all those boxes um, really does have a huge impact on watersheds. And yeah. um, mm. what we are needing to do at this point is to figure out how to reduce that impact, how to right. learn how to. And what we saw in those Puerto Rican films, you know, is that you know, communities coming together, local communities coming together and using the materials that they have locally to, to build communities, to build infrastructure that is resilient. Indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, John, you, you touched on the point of, uh, you know, the, the watershed is a, is a space that needs to be kept in, in balance. And anytime you, you, you're not doing, you're doing something that takes it out of balance, you see the, the impacts right away. And one of those things that impacts the balance in a watershed, of course, would be fires. You know, bushfires, um, and in Saint Anne's, uh, the work that Kemba and her organization um, is is engaged in is is basically fighting fires, right? Um, so, Kemba, if you could just give us a, a, a sense of how a, a bushfires um, impact the watershed, and how ordinary people can sort of mitigate you know, uh, through their behavior or through other ways to mitigate the impacts of these bushfires, to reduce them 
um, and, and reduce their impacts, negative impacts. So I would probably take it with the answering part on the reverse um, and kind of looking at how some of these fires are started or why some of these fires are often started. And that's quite a huge discussion, but just to, to give some small points, one of the things that we've inherited from our colonial era of how we would have done agriculture is a lot of times by cleaning by burning. So you see that practice is still on today in a lot of um, countries, islands in the global south. You would still slash see and burn. Slash and burn. Clean, cleaning by burning, slash and burn mm -hmm. agriculture, because you know some communities, we have a saying in Trinidad, I know our audi audience is broad, but um, <laughs> We have a saying in Trinidad, when you live behind God back <laughs> and you live far away from everything else, you know, anything kind of goes sometimes. Mm -hmm. So what happened when some of people in some of these remote communities and they're heaping and cleaning by burning, fires get out of hand, everybody always assumes they can handle this. But one thing a lot of people don't take into consideration is the natural environment, what is happening with the climate, the wind that is spread, would spread a fire, the fire has basically three elements, you know, in order for the fire to spread and to breed, it requires wind. And mm -hmm. during the dry season, when the winds are strong, a fire could light where you would have thought you could have controlled. And then it just goes out of hand really, really quickly. So those are sometimes fires that are started with good intent, but with, whether it's cleaning by burning or whether it's clearing your agricultural land for food, right? Mm -hmm. And this fire gets out of hand. And then you have the other side of the coin, where people does actually an act of rebellion or war or, or, or spite or this or hatred or whatever like that, where somebody would light a fire. And then when we look at the impact of this on the forest, it, would, it depends on the type of landscape and the type of forest you have, where there's a hilly terrain. In the video, you all would have seen St. Dan's watershed is very hilly, very sloping um, landscape. And what that does, when you lose all that vegetation on a hillside um, forest, a hilly forest, when the rainy season comes about and there is no trees to retain the soil, you know, you're going to be left with a lot of landslides, floodings, uh, and a, a lot of biodiversity loss from the direct bushfire as well, as well as what's taking place in the rainy season. Our St. Anne's River, our Ponsuman River here had a lot of turtles, had a lot of different types of fishes, a lot of manico crab. There is still that in the river, but the amount of things that would have been lost due to the heavy mm -hmm. flooding during the rainy season or the heavy runoff or the fast-paced runoff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we tend to have a discussion around when we're working with students, especially the older ones, and when we have bring up the topic of waste, you know, what are we wasting when we have these disasters? When water is leaving your watershed so quickly and running off into the sea, we are wasting mm -hmm. water. That water mm -hmm. is supposed to go into our water table and later resurface as fresh water, you know, that probably might be Absolutely. accessed in your tap. But in the rivers, mm -hmm. you know, that surface water. And we, you know, when we delve into this kind of topic more and more and more, we would realize how vast and how much, you know, this ripple effect of one fire. So very often when we have to probably, and I'm not the best person at, at this, you know, getting a tiny paragraph to say, this is why, <laughs> you know, we should stop lighting fires, or this is why we should replant the forest after um, the forest is burned down. There's so many different dimensions to it. Because one of the things we have seen with, you know, so many fires, you have migration of species, basically, it would be you'd be left with little to no um, diversity in terms of vegetation, so which mean the wildlife would follow suit. A lot of them mm -hmm. would just migrate to somewhere greener or lush, and a lot yeah. of them also die during the dry season when the fires occur, because that's also the hunting season, nesting season for a lot of animals in the forest. It's yeah. very easy it's very to identify. Right, so it's so it's many different problem. prongs to the impact a fire can have mm -hmm. on a watershed, but that is just to give, I mean, our listening audience a little example of the mm -hmm. impact. Yeah, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a pervasive problem, a very large problem. And, you know, there's no bigger problem than a, a natural disaster, you know, um, which was explored in, in a couple of the films, Mara Vioso, and uh, we're still here. Uh, those two films from 
Puerto Rico, which was shot in the, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, and so, I mean, those, the audience would have seen those films and uh, obviously they're about resilience and they're about community power um, and they're about, you know, models of recovery post-disaster. Um, but I was wondering, you know, like how do we get people engaged in some of these models and some of this thinking, you know, before there's a disaster, you know, like how do we excite people to solve some of these problems? Um, some of these environmental and sometimes social problems that are connected, you know, before there's a major conflagration, a major um, issue, you know, um, what is, you know, what in your minds might be the lever or the key um, to get people a little bit more uh, motivated to activate uh, solutions? What do you think? John? You want me to go yeah. first? I don't want to. I, I know it's a, it's a big question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, right, I'm going to go. Yeah. Okay. You, oh, you mean you... me? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry we, we're all in St. John's and we have a little stain about that, but that's okay. Oh, um, but one, one of the things to get people, you know, going towards something, we have to kind of meet people where they are. And I think sometimes that is where our donor community and corporate society comes in and take a play at this. We have so many young people that are interested in environment. A lot of people have this belief that young people are not interested or that, or they just want this or they just want to live the fast life and go into a party. But the amount of young people we work with on a daily basis, I mean, pre-COVID, post-COVID, pre-COVID, you know, so many young people that we interact with and they would happily come and work with us if they're gainfully employed, mm -hmm. all right? And because we need to put greater value on the forest and we need to put greater value on the services that the forest could create in an eco-friendly way. There is a lot of value to be gained from keeping the forest intact and mm -hmm. rehabilitating and making it better. Um, secondly, always through education. I know John will touch on the art bit a bit more, but <laughs> education and everything, you would hear that going through and through. But not just education in a one-off sense or a field trip or, or that kind of thing, but really getting into the curriculum. Getting into the curriculum. So at every level of school, be it from preschool to till you graduate from university, you mm -hmm. realize that this is something that is a steady thing that we're paying attention to it's the same way exactly the same way your professor would say okay you lose five points because you didn't consider all the grammatical errors and how you speak and present or write the same mm -hmm. way we could be thinking about okay so what is the ecological factor or impact of all our decisions or actions or so on and if that is in our consciousness you know from day one till we we get older we will be living more in harmony and also the use of green spaces mm -hmm. i can't mm -hmm. talk about you know, enough about that. Being okay with sweating, <laughs> being okay with being outdoors. Yes, we know it's so harder for some people depending on what situation they're going to, but the more and more trees you plant and the more and more connected you get, you won't be so hot, right? You, you have rivers to cool down, you have the beach to cool down, you have the trees, you have the fruits, you have all these things that would refresh you. So getting that connection back and really spending a bit more time out in nature to see how beautiful and amazing and the support it gives us as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, John, not to cut you, but I have a question here that they fed through. And I think you would be a good person to take a stab at it. Um, uh, it was actually a question that I was going to ask um, anyway. So it's convenient that it popped up. Uh, the question is, uh, how important is, is art? Uh, when it comes to educating society about where we are at ecologically, environmentally. Yeah. How important is art? I mean, well, yeah. yeah, I think it's key. I think, you know, um, music, I mean, so much of the music that, that is popular music that, you know, what, what the musicians are talking about, what they're, they're encouraging, what they're trying to, to, to move the culture in the direction of is, is you know, love, you know, and, and togetherness and, and community and support. And mm -hmm. um, I think, it, you know, it really is key. Um, as a performance artist, I too, um, 
you know, I'm driven by sharing that idea of our connection. But I think for me personally, the real key, and Kemba touched on it, is getting people back into nature. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from very, very, very young that, you know, every um, child should be um, given opportunity to spend time in nature and yeah. you know, ideally unstructured time in nature. I think that's key to actually changing the culture. Unless children start to experience that direct link, you know, with the bush um, mm -hmm. from very, very early, um, it's going to be very difficult for the transformation to happen. But yeah. we're seeing it, we're seeing the, the community spirit in all the, the, the other movies, you know, we're seeing that community spirit, um, you know, rising up in the face of disaster. I mean, sad to say, you know, it takes a disaster. You were mentioning that cover, you know, that, that for, the, for, the, for that to happen sometimes. But I guess, you know, even if that is the way, it, it's going to happen. It needs to happen. And that um, is, is through, you know, the thing is, I mean, art, for me, you know, I, I have to admit that as a visual artist, I, I became, um, you know, disappointed in my ability to reach people through visual art, which is how come I ended up turning to permaculture, which mm -hmm. what I, I describe it as edible landscaping. So I'm working with the land as my canvas and mm -hmm. I am creating food forests for wildlife. So mm -hmm. that we can all have more biodiversity, more access to, to natural um, spaces and to food, to wild foods, to you know, learning what all the all the berries that are edible in the forest, all the leaves that are edible to fo in the forest, and how to prepare them if they're not you know edible raw. Um, all these kinds of activities. As an artist, I feel very um, drawn Connected. to sharing these yes. these. Um, these realities with people and yeah, we need more absolutely. artists doing that kind of work. Yeah, yeah I mean art, art art is is something that you know it it it's about the heart, you know, and nature is is also about the heart. And art is partially about improvisation and problem solving and figuring things out. And nature, you know, improvises and you know figures things out. As well, yep. there, there, there's a yep. there's a very strong correlation between you know artistic thinking and artistic endeavors and what yep. is possible when you engage with a in the ecological space in nature, you know. Um, and I think it's important, you know, for your work, um, your 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 work, uh, John, and your work, Kemba, and, and my work too, to to connect the two, you know, and, and and to show how connected those ideas are and how interdependent they are and should be and continue to be you know um, because um i was about to add quickly sometimes when people hear art the first thing they think is probably a painting or, or a song but right. the spectrum of art is so huge and and sometimes when we're exploring that art for environment we could then engage so many other supporters who are food artists who are you know play artists they can come up with all these games and quizzes and all these things because not mm -hmm. everybody may have that skill and talent because it's an art yeah. right yeah. it's yeah. something that is honed and developed and then putting yes. that value on it so even Absolutely. the filmmaking the storytelling knowing how to capture an audience with certain narratives and sometimes we may be talking and we you know something when you live in it and do it for so many years is, is hard to see it a different way sometimes, but somebody with a, a different set of artistic skills, you know, would find ways to, to highlight a, an issue or to highlight some success stories and really bring it to the forefront that would really bring in more and more supporters. So, you know, as a good encouragement to people in other places as well, if you see something in your community that is noteworthy, you don't need to go and try to form another organization or form another group, partner with them, and find out some ways in which you can amplify their voice or their mm -hmm. work by doing, you know, your type of art with them. You know, mm -hmm. everybody has a gift and a talent, you know? Absolutely, absolutely true. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A chat here. Um, 
But before we jump back into some of those questions, I just wanted to um, quickly touch on one of the other films that was part of the series this evening, um, Carbon Bomb. Um, and for those who saw it, of course, Carbon Bomb is a documentary that was shot in Guyana, and it speaks to the newfound um, energy wealth of Guyana in the form of oil. Um, and it sort of explores the hand that uh, development banks and development agencies have in controlling resources in countries in the global south like Guyana. Um, and the question that I have or that weighed on my mind um, after looking at um, carbon bomb and, and even before that is, is the question of, well, first of all, is, is the resource curse, this um, resource curse that people always talk about in economic circles um, and, and other circles of, are, around you, you, you have these resources, you're, you, you're definitely going to have um, challenges as a result of it. Um, you know, is that real, you know? Or, 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 or what is more real, that or the interference? Is it the interference that's responsible for the challenges that we in Trinidad and Tobago face, that um, Brazil faces, that you know, um, even larger countries like India face, you know, a lot of African countries that are very resource which continue to have um, economic and social challenges. So, you know, just briefly before we get, jump into um, some of the questions that have been coming through, and uh, we have several now, you know, just, just give me a sense of what you guys think, you know, briefly um, about this issue, you know, it, is, is, is the resource curse real or is it a made up fiction to obfuscate the issues, <laughs> you know, um, and the development agencies are really responsible for the challenges that we have, that we see, what do you think? Well, I think it is a real thing, but it is a direct result of the economic system that we are saddled with. Um, that if um, corporations need to make profits um, and the resources, the raw materials that they need for all the um, gadgets that they want to make, um, you know, are in countries that don't have infrastructure. Um, and, and so on, you know, that they can offer this development model where they will promise schools and roads and ports and whatever in order to get those raw materials that they need. But really this model of development, this economic model is destroying the planet. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And so the model itself, mm -hmm. the idea of perpetual growth on a biological community that, you know, is finite, um, is, 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 is cannot end well. It's, it's a very, um, it's a dead end. It was always going to be a dead end. Dependent, mm -hmm. Dependence on finite fossil fuels as your energy source was always going to be a dead end. And the sooner the better, now that we see the consequences of converting all that um, dead matter, you know, million, era, million years old um, solar capture um, that they're, you know, they've taken just 300 years to pump back into the atmosphere. I mean, it has to stop. Um, and the only way it's going to stop is if it, local communities start to figure out how to live in balance with their ecosystems, their watersheds, and their bioregions. And they're only going to be able to do that if they get out into nature and start learning the connections, seeing, you mm -hmm. know, where are the animals feeding, when are they feeding, when are they mating, you know, how do we improve the situation for everybody, all mm -hmm. persons, all our relations? All our relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that this discussion has been going on for decades, especially looking at the new development um, discourse and, and discontent with the global model, with the Western global model that is, is often shown as developed. Because if you had a several photos in front of you and images and you ask a bunch of people, a random bunch of hundred people, point out which one is developed country, they would not pick one that somebody's just laying on a grass, you know, swinging and eating some mango or picking a coconut. They will immediately say that is underdeveloped because you should buy a bottle of coconut water from the grocery because that is development, 
right? right. So when we think about exactly when we think about the idea of development and who does it serve and the handicaps that it gives us, it doesn't give us any power. Because if you come and build our roads, nobody actually has the capabilities to do that. When they leave, everything falls apart and then you blame the government for being corrupt. I mean, we're not, we're not saying a green or denying that that is not the case, but what I'm saying is the system now, everything is then rooted up if people were to follow their, their history, especially with how third world countries developed and became their own nation, it's having to recover from the shock of the global power, removing all their support, just like that. And then you have to figure it all out with limited resources and now being trapped in that rat race cycle Mm-hmm. And having you believe that you really have the power to change it using their same model. And then, as John rightfully said, is getting connected and actually understanding ways in which we could re- begin to reduce our dependency. Because I'm not going to sit here and pretend like we're not using it because we're all on a laptop and a device and we're all yeah. using electricity or some sort of power right now. Mm-hmm. But the steps in which we need to take to reduce, I'm um, in our resource center right here, we don't have any air conditioned units. Okay, so it's about are you willing to sit in an office or work in a space that 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 doesn't exist. So it's all about trying to wean ourselves off of some dependency things that we know are high energy, high you know impact on our natural environment. Absolutely, I agree with that. So let's just jump into some of these questions. Um, and if we have time at the end, we can circle back to some of these other discussion points. Um, so let's see. Uh, this question is from Shane Slater, tuning in from Jamaica. The first two sets of films demonstrated younger generations promoting environmental protection. Through your work, have you noticed significant differences across the Caribbean? across the Caribbean generations with regards to their environmental awareness and activism. So I think this question is, is I think what they're asking is, um, you know, is there a difference between perhaps our kids um, and us and our parents and our kids and us in terms of, you know, what, their environmental perspective is um, and what they consider to be important. I think, um, because we work a lot upon someone here with a lot of kids. Um, Well, just behind me is one of my activity books that we recently designed and so on. But one of the things that we realize when we bring kids here in the forest, we realize that there's such a difference to when we had our experiences growing up as a child living in on, on the outer rims of a city. So where you would have bush behind you or a river behind you or a ravine somewhere nearby within your community. And now you look at so many social ills that are happening now that sometimes are swept under the carpet because probably there's not funding to deal with that as well. You have a lot of kids unsupervised, locked in a house, watching a, a, um, a television screen for safety. Mm-hmm. All right, for safety reasons, or they're not part of a larger community where they have someone looking out for them and saying, you know, yes, uh, uh, looking after the kids, or yes, all the kids are in the road, or yes, you know, they have some sort of shared community, right? Mm -hmm. So now, because of, you know, some of the social ills and so on, you find that the poorer kids are the ones who now don't know about going to the river, don't know about hiking, don't know about all the fruit trees and all the mango trees and making mango chow and crossing the river to pick a cocoa from the tree because you think it's looking ripe and ready to eat or you're just hungry walking from school or just want to be up to kid stuff. That is mm-hmm. that no longer exists for a certain section of the population that would have gained a different type of cultural capital through these lived experiences. Mm-hmm. So now mm-hmm. it, it was a shocker for me a couple of years ago to realize how much that has slipped Whereas the children who are now middle and upper class, they're going cycling, they're going on these nature parks, they're going to all these resorts, eco resorts and all these things, going to the beach, have this, that. So mm-hmm. you really see that shift, um, that cultural shift. And it's really, it's really sad. Yeah. You so it's, it's really, it's, it, it's, it's more than an age bracket. It's, it's more of an economic 
yeah. bracket at this point. That's yeah, a luxury yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, John, there's a question. It looks like it's specifically for you. I'll read it out. Um, Kai from the live screening in St. Vincent asks, John's work really resonated with me. How can I help communities connect together to drive a community-based connection with the local environment? That is, identify what local flora and fauna could and should be protected. Also, when are you coming to St. Vincent again? <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi, Kai. Yes, thank you for that question. Well, I mean, I, 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 my advice would always be start with your own community. You know, whether you're in an urban neighborhood or you're in a rural village, um, that's where it has to start. It starts in the ecosystem that you call home. Eco is a word that actually originally meant home in the Greek. So yeah, that, that, that's what needs to happen. We need to, we need to model um, that um, appropriate connection to our environments locally, you know, right? You know, the soil in your backyard, that's where you start. You start mining the soil in your backyard um, by, um, you know, composting and um, keeping your leaf litter around and, um, and growing, uh, uh, allowing um, all the um, shrubs and uh, um, wild flowers that want to come up in your yard to allow them to come. These are the foods for the wildlife, you know, at the bottom of the food chain and the insects that depend on the wildflowers that come up naturally around us and that most of us are waging war against, you know, and they're also the medicinals. They, um, a lot of the, these plants are, are beneficial for building our immune system, um, learning those kinds of relationships how all the various medicinal plants that are uh, in our immediate environment, we're literally surrounded by them, um, how we can use them to strengthen our immune systems and protect us against um, specific diseases as well. Um, so yeah, start local, start with your community and then, you know, um, keep a record, you know, um, record everything and start to, you know, make art, make movies, make music, together and share it. Um, that's the only way it's gonna really happen is that every neighborhood and village has to um, start where their feet touch the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, I uh, agree with that 100%. Um, also, I'll be an advocate for Kai. <laughs> Do you plan to go back to St. Vincent anytime soon, um, Jod? I, I am not planning to travel at all in the, in the near, future in the near future or even in the long-term future. If it okay. happens, it will be it will be something quite dramatic. I, I don't I, I have too much work to do in my watershed I and my ecosystem at this so, point in my life. So Kai, you, you might need to pay a visit to the St. Anne's watershed um, to connect with John. And and while you're here. Um, as we said earlier, Kemba is also in the watershed and I am also in the watershed. If you do make it down to Trinidad, please give us a shout. We'd be happy to, to chat with you and, and tell you about the work that we're doing and, and so on. Right, so there's another question here. It looks like it's for me. So I will um, read it and then I will answer it. Um, this question is from Beth from London, but in St. Vincent. Uh, the format of the very short shorts was simple yet impactful. How was this program initiated and what was the response from the filmmakers being part of this, especially the younger generation? Uh, thanks for that question, Beth. Um, very short shorts started uh, five years ago now um, as a means within the context of the Green Screen Environmental Film Festival to sort of flatten the playing field a little bit, level the playing field a little bit for filmmakers um, locally and eventually um, regionally and internationally. Uh, so that even if you don't have a lot of fancy equipment or a lot of experience making films, you could still use your phone and make something really, really short, um, but you have to think about it and you have to plan, 
you know, because it's it's really short as a micro short, one minute. Um, so even though you might not have a lot of fantastic fantastic equipment, you don't need it. What you need is to figure out how you're going to tell this story in one minute. Um, so yeah, everybody has a phone, right? Um, even if it's you know uh, not the best and not the best camera, uh, everybody has a phone, and that means that everybody can anybody can shoot a short film and put something together that would tell a story. And that's what we wanted. We wanted uh, to give more access to people for participation in the festival. Um, and the response was has been really, really, really encouraging, really, really good um, over the years. Um, we, we've gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of submissions. Uh, some years we get, you know, more than we expect. Some years we might not get as, as many as we want. But every year we really are treated to a, a lot of talent and a, a lot of quality production, um, even though it's, you know, all shot on, on mobile films. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that, you know, if you're a professional or, you know, a semi-professional filmmaker, you can't participate. You just have to shoot on a, on a mobile phone as, as well. So we, we've had um, professional filmmakers participate as well. Um, and we're really happy about that as well. We want to encourage as many people as possible to do that, to, to participate and, and submit stuff. Um, this year, the competition opens once again in June. Um, and so we'll be coming out with the theme and the, all the, the details around the competition very soon. So um, you can look out for that on our social media. That's at Green Screen TT um, on, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. At Green Screen TT, you'll find us. Um, on our website, it's greenscreen.film, greenscreen.film. So you can go up on the website and, you know, you can check out some of our films on the website, our program from last year is still there uh, with the very short shorts, so you can, you can check them out. Um, yeah, and I think that we've, we've been sort of, you know, um, we want to engage uh, a wider audience for participation with very short shorts as well. And so last year we opened it up with a new category, a new arm of the, the, the competition that is international. Uh, so anybody from anywhere can submit films to that particular um, competition. It's the Very Short Shorts International competition, um, which is open right now, actually. Um, that one has no theme, whatever you want to do once it's focused on environmental or sustainability issues whatever your heart desire, whatever your imagination wants to produce, we will accept it and review it. Um, so, uh, so like I said, it's open to submissions. You can submit anytime. Um, and also we wanted, I know we're, we've been talking to the folks at Hiruna about a special category for Vincentian filmmakers as well. Um, we haven't really refined what that would look like yet, but you know, I'm very open to it. Uh, so we'll see, you know, if that actually comes to fruition. Um, but yeah, I, I look forward to the possibilities when it, when it comes to very short shorts and hoping to expand it even more and more going forward in the future. So we're now at 9.30, um, full 45 minutes of discussions. Um, I think that um, Kai says he will be coming to see you all. <laughs> Wow. So you can expect a visit from, from Kai. Um, so, so yeah, I think we, we, can, um, we can comfortably wrap. And um, if there are any parting comments from either Kemba or John, um, I'll be happy to uh, give you the floor and then we'll close. If yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, well, I just want to um, draw people's attention. Um, to the foundation for the bioregional autonomy of the Orinoco watershed. That is the bioregion within which Trinidad and the Southern Caribbean um, is located. And um, the, so there's a, a website, fbau.org, and there's also a Facebook page where you can see the history of um, the work we've been doing working with the Fonds of Man's community since 2017 to um, clear fire traces and big contour drains from the top of the St. Anne's Ridge coming down 
um, trying to reduce. So what was happening over the years is that as the Fonds de Man's reforestation project, um, the community project was um, coming up the hill, every year fires would come, burn down the ferns at the top of the ridge and then extend further down into the forest. We will be losing more forest canopy from the top coming down over the years. So I'm trying to reverse that process um, with um, the, by the foundation work up there. So I look forward to uh, hearing from people, um, you know, friend me on Facebook and we can um, see how we can make this movement um, go viral. Thank you, John. Kemba, any final yeah. words? So in closing, um, you know, likewise, you all can look up the Fonsuman Community Reforestation Project, quite a lot long name, but FACRP for short, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can get to see what we're doing. And I know a lot of you have been asking a lot about the education side of it, but it's all about you know, documenting what you see, sharing the information and letting people be a bit more aware. It takes a lot of time. So, I mean, once you're passionate about it, you can get the ball rolling. I've been doing this for the past like three decades. I wouldn't give away too much, but, you know, it's, it's, it's been very impactful. And, you know, one of the most heartwarming thing is when you work with a child in preschool or primary school, and then they come back when they're 18, 20, and come to volunteer or to do their work placement or research project. So, you know, mm -hmm. you see the full circle. So, you know, you know, I know, you know, we know at once that the work that we're doing is impactful and it's not just in the, in the community, as the name says, it's quite far reaching on a global level. Um, where we have people from all over the world that visit here to learn about what we do and sharing the model of community forestry. So that is, you know, we look forward to sharing and, and just, you know, having discussions. But thanks for listening to us and go about having a nice green time. A nice green time. That's a, that's a good way to close this evening. <laughs> thanks for that uh, sound, sound bite there, Kemba. Uh, thanks to you and John for making the time for this chat um, at the High Runa Film Festival 2022. Uh, thanks again to the festival for having us and for making space for environmental films in their program this year. And we look forward to um, next year and expanding uh, this aspect of, of the festival. I'd be happy to see um, where this goes. Uh, the, the more, more eyes on these messages uh, as the better for us um, in the long term. I, I think everybody can agree. So um, once again, thanks to the festival, thanks to our panelists this evening, and thanks to the audience. And I uh, bid you all a good night. Take care and goodbye. Thanks. Thank you.